going to be talking about trade, the deerskin trade, and a lot of the uh, actions going on that had a lot to do with the early history of South Carolina colony and the early days, the formative years of the country, actually. Uh, we're privileged today to have Sue Kelly, one of our trained guides, that will be um, showing a, um, slides and talking about Fort Congaree in the 18th century. Uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Sue. Well, thank you very much, John. Uh, in my uh, video block, it says Gary Kelly. I'm Sue. I'll um, use my husband's computer. But I wanted to uh, take on a journey today through the kidnapping, murder, and the massacre in the 18th century that happened right in our park. Um, there were three colonial parks that were in this region. Also, one of them was in the history park, but they're all in the 1700s. I'd like to start with this map. I love old maps. Uh, this was a map called Carolina, and it's from the early 1700s, done by a, a gentleman, Herman Mall, who was sitting in a studio in London, uh, drawing our world. And this is what it looked like to him. It was a ragged coastline. It had dozens of rivers. This shows some tribes, some settlements. But right in the middle of it, and this is another reason I included it, was that there is a red dot, and that dot is on the Congaree River and labeled with the Congaree Indians. We're on the map. Let's move back a little bit to 1700. This is what an old growth forest looks like, and this is what we had. Um, this is not what the park looks like today. Today, the park has a lot of undergrowth. But this is an old growth forest, like Francis Beadler is today, like the Ellicott Rot Forest in South Carolina is today. And what this means is the forest was natural. Uh, the canopy was very, very high. There was no undergrowth. And in 1700, a, an explorer named John Lawson traveled through here. He wrote that you could gallop a horse through these woods and never touch a limb. Up in the tree branches would be the birds that you see in the flock in the corner. Those are Carolina parakeets. We don't have them anymore, but this beautiful green bird at this time was pretty much a nuisance. Um, it could wipe out an entire crop. Uh, farmers would kill as many as they could. And later in time, uh, ladies would take their beautiful green feathers and wear them in hats. The land was affected by flooding, just as it is today. And although the creeks and rivers have wandered a little bit, the fall line was a factor in the settlement here. The Indians. In 1700, there were approximately 28 tribes, numbering anywhere from 30 to 40,000 people. These tribes traveled extensively. They traded among themselves. And as you would wander through this area, interspersed among the trees would be clearings called Indian Old Fields. In the Indian Old Fields, these are areas that would have been cleared by the Indians. They understood that if you cleared an area, that that clearing would attract animals and the new growth would come and it would be a good place in the meantime to grow crops. Uh, right here in our park would have been the Congaree Indians, described as a small tribe including about 100 males. They were peaceful, they were agricultural, and as John Lawson said, they were handsome. They kept cranes as pets, and they had been nudged into this area by the watery Indians who were described as tall. And 18 years later, the 28 tribes that I'm talking about would be down to two. But let's talk about the Congaree Indians for just a minute. Why did I take you to Missouri? Well, this is Cahokia. Cahokia is the largest of the Mississippian mounds. To understand them, you go right across the river from St. Louis. And 800 to 1,200 years ago, Indian mound builders built over 80 reasons for 80, excuse me, 80 mounds for a lot of reasons, for burial reasons, ceremonial reasons, and as a platform for their chiefs. The town grew over to 40,000 people. And at the time, Cahokia was the largest city in America until Philadelphia passed it in 1730. But like any big town, it had its problems. It had sanitation problems, food was an issue, and many Indians who lived here moved away to form new villages. Our Congarees are believed to have come from those Indians uh, that were out in this region. Uh, they decided that because of the pottery identification. The designs 
were carved on a paddle, the pottery was, was tapped, and those are identical to what has been found on our grounds. And then we have the colonists. The Carolina colony was basically British, uh, governed by the proprietors and a colonial governor. Most of us were British. There were some German, some French Huguenots. The town population was about 3,500. Most of these people were white and almost all lived in Charlestown. In about 10 years, there would be a black majority in the Carolina colony. Dealing with the growing black population will influence dis decisions for decades. I'm glad he's smiling. If he wasn't smiling, he'd be a little scary. This is a trader. Scattered throughout South Carolina were about 100 traders, a rough edge of society, almost outcast group of men who wandered through the colony taking goods from Charlestown merchants and bringing back Indian goods. They were either hired by a merchant or they were given credit. They would travel with a pack horse and possibly an assistant. And the trade in South Carolina, in the Carolina colony, was supported by three main economies. Naval goods. Now remember, Britain had the biggest navy. And we had pitch, tar, we had wood for masts, we had wood for ships. We also supplied the Caribbean colonies with supplies, such as salted beef, salted pork, and staves, which are the slats for barrels and we traded with the Indians. What did the Indians want? They wanted everything. They wanted knives, they wanted guns, they wanted axes, hoes, clothing, blankets, metal cookware, and rum. This gent is wearing silk stockings. The rest of it is all his clothing with the exception of the pipe. The pipe being long like that would have been a tavern pipe. So he would have traded deer skins for his stockings and for his pipe. And what did the colonists want? Well, they want skins. They want deer skins. An average of 54,000 skins per year were shipped from Carolina from 1699 to 1715. And the colonists wanted slaves. From 1680 to 1720, 40,000 Indians were captured and shipped to the West Indies to work on sugar plantations. It was difficult to keep Indians here as slaves because Indians knew the land and they would get away and they would find their way back to their tribe. Many of you might recognize this, this is the Cherokee path. And when you're in our park, it goes right through the middle of it. The old Cherokee trail goes from Charlestown to Lake Kiowee. Then it goes up through Cherokee country and it was originally an animal path. People follow animals. Then it became the Cherokee path. Then it became the Cherokee trail. And then it became state road. And then it became old state road. The difference between a path and a trail is whether you can walk side by side or follow. It intersects with the Catawba trail on the other side of the river. From there, you can walk all the way to New York to Ohio, to Pennsylvania, anywhere north. It is also located parallel to the fall line on the Congaree River. When conditions are appropriate, Indians could wade across the river here. This road has a deep colonial history as not only to our Fort Congaree located on it, but also is Fort 96, Fort Dorchester, Fort Prince George, which is now under Lake Kiwi. But by 1911, Relationships between the colonists and the Indians was going really sour. It got so bad that the Carolina colony split into North and South Carolina to let each region deal with its problems. Down near Beaufort County in Yemassee territory, Indian land is taken for rice production. The traders in that area are cheating the Indians with quantities of rum and lengths of cloth. The Indians either got, even got measuring devices from Governor Gibbs and could prove that they were being cheated. They would buy a yard of fabric and it would be 30 inches. And they would buy a gallon of rum and it would be minus a mouthful. But credit, which was called trust then, was issued to the Indians. Unpaid debts resulted in being tarred, beaten, 
and enslaved. In 1711, the Yemassee had a debt of 100,000 deerskins. Our relationship was, was shattered. Casey Museum. In 1715, the Yemassee attacked the colonists around Charlestown, brutally killing about 400 colonists. Many colonists flee the country. Some flee to ships in the harbor. Half of all farming in the area is abandoned because nobody wants to live on the frontier. And Charlestown starts to starve. The colonial economy is tanking as all the credit has been issued to the traders and all the credit that was issued to the Indians has been wiped out. You can't collect from dead people. So the colonists raise prices sky high for the naval stores, hoping to make up for the trading loss. On top of all of this, the white-tailed deer population is depleted. Only time will correct this. But several things happen simultaneously in 1716. First on the Indian side, the Creek Indians capitalize on the chaos and organize 15 tribes against the colony, basically continuing the Yamasee War. Traders are being killed, houses are burned. The colonists approach the Cherokee and beg for help. The Cherokee have three choices, neutrality, side with the Creek against the colonists, or side with the colonists against the Creek. They are very slow to decide and eventually choose neutrality. They invite the Creek ambassadors to a trading signing, but things go horribly wrong. The Cherokee kill 13 ambassadors and simultaneously burn several Creek villages. This is known as the Tougaloo Massacre and was obviously premeditated by someone. So the Cherokees are all in now with the British. They send 5,000 warriors to join our colonists, 1,400 militia and slaves, and they decimate the tribes. The Indians are killed, enslaved, or run away. Our Congarees are mostly gone. They are enslaved, killed, or taken in by the Catawba and the Cherokee. So we are down from 28 tribes to just two, the Cherokee and the Catawba by 1717. So uh, yes. we have a request for, if you could possibly turn up your microphone. Uh, I'll speak up as my microphone is what it is. Yeah, just a little louder, maybe that'll, that'll okay. work. Thank you. I'll be closer. But something had to be done to protect the fragile trade following the Yemassee War. The Board of Commissioners takes control and sets up the public monopoly of 1716. All private trading has ended. All trading will be handled by the colony. Fair trade prices will be set. Pack horses will be available to the Indians. One pack horse can carry 150 pounds. A man can carry about 60. Regular stores were set up in Indian villages so the Cherokee and the Catawba don't have to travel close to the colonists. The person handling the store had to be literate so they could provide reports to the governor. And they also decided to build three frontier forts. Fort Moore in Augusta, the Winya factory near Georgetown, and our Fort Congaree. These are called forts, but operated as trading posts built like forts. The person who would run the trade was called a factor. His assistant was a sub factor. So these forts were called factories. Transportation of goods is greatly altered. Those carrying the goods from the fort to Charlestown are called porters or public servants. These are generally unarmed slaves and indentured servants. Many considered it a better life because they were unsupervised. They wore a very coarse cloth called Honestberg, usually used for sacks to identify them. Some perimeters are drawn. There will be no enslavement of Indians within 400 miles of, of Charlestown. That perimeter is Tallahassee, Florida, to Nashville, Tennessee, to Richmond, Virginia. So Indian enslavement virtually disappears. The line is drawn between the three forts. Outside the line is frontier. You're on your own. Traders are now licensed and can't operate within 20 miles of the fort. So two of these forts, 
Fort Moore and Winya Factory have been completed in 1717. Fort Congaree is to be commanded by Lieutenant James Howe. He receives 12 men, supplies, and a pirogue, which is a flat-bottomed riverboat. Halfway up the Congaree River, the 12 men mutiny and leave Lieutenant Howe on the riverbank. They are never heard from again. Lieutenant Howe walks back to Charlestown, tells his story, and asks to be resupplied. Charlestown just couldn't afford it, and he decided to scrap the whole idea. Lieutenant Howe, by the way, ends up running a store in a Catawba village. A few months later, after pleas from the Cherokee to put up a fort, Charlestown hires Captain Charles Russell. Captain Charles Russell is a tough guy. He's a militia guy. He's, I think, the real deal. Cherokees want a fort, not just a trading fort, and want it also as a safe place for their families should trouble break out. Captain Russell is given a horse and is told to recruit his own men. He travels by land with 13 to 21 men and three slaves. Two troops of rangers are set to, sent to the region to patrol while the fort is being built. 80 Cherokees are waiting at the fort site to help him build the fort. By law, this will be the last time that any Cherokees will be allowed inside the fort. Okay, this is a picture from our tour. Um, that's me on the left and my group. And this is a point on the trail called the Overlook. So if you see a little sign that says, turn left here to go to the Overlook, what you're looking at here is uh, the Congaree Creek. And I'm pointing to the bank and at the top of the uh, crest of the hill on the other side is where our fort would be. This is a LIDAR map. LIDAR is a um, light detecting uh, process done with lasers and records show when we tried to figure out where Fort Congaree was records show that it was located at the point where the creek turned south so you can see right in the middle there it points to Fort Congaree and boy does the creek turn south at that point and here's our fort now this is a artist rendering but I think we can learn a lot from this um, this fort operated from 1718 to 1722. It was 150 feet by 150 feet. It was palisaded, which means that it had uh, timbers standing like a huge fence on three sides of it. Uh, the other side was the creek. There were three dry moats and there were bastions. Bastions are the corner uh, points. Inside the fort, we believe that there were three buildings. And in the four years that the fort operated, there were anywhere from 13 to 50 men who resided here. And as you look at the, um, the canoes that are here, you'll see the stacked deer skins. You always stacked them with the fur to the inside. Uh, you'll see some bushels of corn that are there. The corn, uh, it could substitute one skin. A bushel of corn could do that. And if you look around the people, you'll see that we have Indians, we have militia, and we have the three black slaves that are off to the left. And we promised that there would be fair trade. So you can see very easily here what is valuable. What the numbers represent is the number of pounds. So the first item, a gun at 16 pounds is very, very valuable. On the second column, you'll see 20 pounds. Uh, a pound of vermilion and two pounds of lead, well, those are two toxic um, substances, but the Indians used them for painting, and that was a very valuable item, too. Uh, the little chart on the right-hand side talks about uh, the different kinds of skin and their value. Uh, in the chart itself, it talks about half thick. Half thick would be um, the weight of a blanket. On the top of the right, it talks about a ditto. A ditto is a three-piece suit. So going back to our, our um, gentleman in the beginning of the presentation that had the, uh, the laced silk um, leggings on, he would have given up a couple of deerskins to be able to dress that well.
this is that same LIDAR map. I've just blown it up here, but I wanted to show you the um, six lines that are running uh, basically north and south. And those are scrapings because this is showing you how archaeology has uh, come a heck of a long way. This was David Anderson in, seven, in 1974. He decided that, yes, the fort must be around here somewhere. So he used motor graders, which are big old machines, and he scraped the surface. He thought it was the best way to excavate. And he found stuff. What he found was the campgrounds of the Indians. He found a lot of pottery shards, uh, scrapers, and uh, basically gave us an idea of where the Indians were when they were trading. Because remember, they're not allowed inside. In 1989, James Mickey was an archaeologist, and he found the eastern moat and the southeast bastion of the um, fort. And he found black glass and he found ceramics. But in 2011 and 2013, archaeologist James Stewart did 100 shovel test points in the area of the fort itself. I would say he found the mother load. And this is um, James Mickey's chart on the, on the right side. Uh, going north to south, you see two um, parallel lines. That's a moat that he found. Moats went about eight feet deep. They were sloped at the bottom and the deepest part being away from it. Uh, it was not lined. It was not filled with water, but it did tend to collect things over time as, as you know, our region floods and items were found um, within that within that moat. Uh, the top left corner, I'll show you a larger picture in a moment. That is the moat in the bottom left corner. Um, those are not blocks. That is just how they had dug it out. And this is the storeroom. There's a cellar floor. Uh, those are bricks and the bricks were, uh, you can't quite see it here, but from the gentleman that's standing his legs, uh, going toward 12 o'clock, uh, there was more of an angled line. Um, in this cellar, they found a gun barrel, they found a knife, they found buckshot, they found a turtle carapace, that would have been probably dinner, and they found a bunch of barrel staves, and they've got, of course, the local brick that's right there. And now the good stuff. Here we go with um, archaeological finds that were found uh, on our site. The first one is pipes. James Stewart said that in every shovel test point that he did, he found, and remember he did a hundred of them, he found a piece of a pipe. Um, these are maker's, mic, mar, excuse me, maker's marks that they found on the pipes on the top row. Um, and the way that they smoked pipes back in the 1800s, 1700s was you would uh, break off a little bit at the end of it because it would tend to uh, clog up and you might also be sharing the pipe. It was a tavern pipe. So they're going to find a lot of pieces of pipe stems, but to find the bowl like this is, is pretty awesome. Uh, the bottom left is um, bronze, and that is a ring that would have been used for sealing wax. That was found at a um, tumble down house that was on the property, not on the fort property, but right nearby. You could see it from the fort. And you'll also see that it has a lion seal matrix. Now there is a story with that that is conjecture that um, there were 32 Scottish Jacobites who supported the restoration of the House of Stuart to the British throne who were sent over to America. It's a great way to get rid of your bad people. You send them away. And this uh, sealing wax ring was a mass produced ring. It would have been uh, sold in stationary stores. And one of the 32 Scottish uh, indentured servants that were sent here, one of them was a doctor and he came to Fort uh, Congaree. So maybe it was his, we are not sure. And the last piece there is a porcelain scraper that would have been used for um, the hides. And I think the top left one, this is probably the coolest piece. This was found with a um, metal detector. This was uh, not on the fort site, but right nearby. This is a hand grenade. And it did not explode. It was, it just kind of fell apart. But what are we doing with a hand grenade? Because this style is basically a ship to ship 
hand grenade that possibly would have been in Charleston. Um, the paste jewelry that is on the right side, paste jewelry is made by grinding up uh, leaded glass, adding some gum, you can press it, you can carve it, you can mold it. And if you can see that it's got a, a great ship design on it. The bottom left corner is black glass black glass. It has uh, various minerals that are added to it. Uh, could have been iron, could have been magnesium, could have been one of about 15 other minerals. It made it darker, it made it stronger. And then of course, we have the trade beads. So back to our fort. In 1719, it's a year old, the colonists have already had it with the proprietors and petitioned King George I to take over from the proprietors. That is granted. It takes about 10 years to figure out how to pay off the pro proprietors and how to um, get it back under the king. But in 1729, that's all finally finalized. finalized. We are now under the king. By 1721, we are operating as a royal colony and have a royal governor. Francis Nicholson. He arrives with 100 British independent companies of foot and four officers. These are the first British military to be sent to South Carolina. Britain has colonies all over the world that are protected by the independent companies. But Britain didn't just have available men sitting around waiting to go to America. So ours was made up of old, retired, and deserted soldiers who were actually taken from the old soldiers' home in England. They didn't even know where they were going when they got on the boat. Many of them were very sick. When they got to Charlestown, those uh, British company of foot soldiers were sent to Fort Moore and to Fort Congaree to recuperate, replacing the militia that was there. The militia is gone. Later that same year, in August 1721, orders were received to close down the fort. The public monopoly of 1716's ending private trading has ended, returning South Carolina to licensed private traders once again. The fort is demolished. It could have been from local people taking the timber. It could have just been from time. But the three slaves are sent to Fort Moore the British Independent Company was sent to build a fort on the Altamaha River near Brunswick, Georgia to protect against the Spanish. Some trading continued in the area, but the fort is gone. And that ends Fort Congaree One. So who's this guy? I'd like to introduce you to Governor Robert Johnson. We are now back under the crown. We are under King George II. And this is Royal Governor Robert Johnson, and he has a problem. Those who might immigrate here are very reluctant. They want immigrants. Immigrants pay taxes. And South Carolina has had Indian Wars, rattlesnakes, all kinds of diseases, and in some locations, a 20 to one black population to white in Charlestown. Governor Robert Johnson said, Nothing is so much needed in South Carolina as white inhabitants. Governor Robert Johnson really wants to attract new white immigrants to protect against hostile Indians and French and Spanish invasions. There needed to be a buffer zone and he develops the township scheme. Township scheme, uh, scheme is a good word, it means plan. So, he chooses 10 locations in South Carolina. You can see number nine, which is about at 10 o'clock there. That's the Welsh track that came along about five, six years later. But each of these 10 locations in South Carolina was to have 20,000 acres. He said that if you come to South Carolina, you get waived taxes for 10 years, a town lot, 50 acres in the township to farm, and when the township reaches 100 heads of household, you can send two representatives to Charlestown. The town lots which became Granby were important to the governor. He did not want South Carolina to look like Virginia. Plantations spread all over the place, 
with miles between them. You didn't have any neighbors and he didn't like it. So if you had to live in the town, you'd get farmland nearby. Governor Johnson also knew that the name Congaree wouldn't attract people here as it is an Indian name. So he chose Saxe-Gotha, commemorating the marriage of the Prince of Wales to Princess Augusta of Germany. That should attract both British and Germans to the township, and it did. Saxe-Gotha, there we go. Um, if you look at this, you'll see the parish, you'll see the township, the difference is um, the church and the township itself. Uh, parish is the church land and the township is the, uh, the, the township itself. Uh, you'll see Granby there is a big square and the red square that is there is Fort Congaree one. I call this a puzzle map because boy, is it complicated, but the red dot is where Fort Congaree one was. And I'm going to tell you about two brothers and keep that little spot in your mind. Uh, one other thing that's interesting here is people think of Granby as just being on the one side of the river. Granby was on both sides and there's your river going through the middle of it. Two brothers, Patrick and Thomas Brown from Londonary, England, received two tracts of land in Saxe-Gotha. Patrick receives the land where the old Fort Congaree one was. Thomas also receives land and the two open a trading post not far from where the old fort was. The town of Granby grows nearby. Granby is named for General Manners, Marquis of Granby, who was a British war hero. The trading post operated by the Brown brothers operates for 18 years. But in 1745, Indian uprisings are occurring again. George Haig, the surveyor, judge, and local mil militiaman leads the colonial representation into Indian territory to try to quell the uprisings. On the way, he rescues two Catawba Indians who were being held captive by other Indians. But Indians have a history of revenge and they have a long memory and two years later, these Indians find George Haig, break into his tent, kidnap him and Thomas Brown's son, William, and another man, an indentured servant, is there and released so he can alert authorities and get a ransom. Haig and his son are taken to Ohio. Along the way, Haig is killed after protesting that they're going to kill him anyway. And you can hear him say, you're, I know you're going to kill me. You might as well kill me now. And after a while, they get tired of hearing it and just take care of him. The boy is eventually returned about a year later. He is mentally affected. He changes his name to Jacob Gardner. He marries and he has six children. But jumping back to 1748, three weeks after this kidnapping, Governor James Glenn declares that Saxe-Gotha needs a new fort. Okay, this is Granby. Uh, you've got the Congaree Squiggly River or Congaree Creek in the bottom. You've got the Congaree River going north and south. And that is the second Fort Congaree, which is where the um, Red Square is. Granby is the site for this new fort. It's right beside Old State Road. This fort gave the citizens of Granby a safe haven from Indians. It was built by Captain James Campbell it is bigger than Fort Congaree one. Fort Congaree one was 150 by 150. This is 170 by 170. It has an officer's house, three barracks, a storeroom, a guard house and workshops and is commanded by Lieutenant Peter Mercier. This is a real fort. This is not a trading post. It is manned by the British Independent Company of Foot again but it is not well stocked. The, the Brits had a lot of colonies and a lot of mouths to feed. So they didn't really uh, deal with that. They expected the people who were being protected to feed them. So the locals did that. The soldiers relied greatly on local citizens for food. The, this fort had an interesting feature. Women were allowed to stay here, wives, girlfriends. They could sleep in the general barracks in the married corner but they were expected to cook and clean. By 1754, 
The French are giving the British colony problems. They are aggressively settling the Ohio Valley down through the Appalachian Mountains. They are bigger issues to worry about than the South Carolina backcountry. Fort Congaree too is shut down. Lieutenant Mercier and most of his garrison George, join Colonel George Washington in Virginia on an expedition to build Fort Necessity in the Ohio Valley. The 800 people who live in Granby are without an occupied fort after six years. But in 1761, Fort Congaree II is used again as a training ground for 2,800 British regulars and South Carolina provincials, including Francis Marion, Isaac Uji, William Moultrie, and Andrew Pickens. We're gonna fast forward to the American Revolution. Fort Granby, 1780. In 1780, Charleston is captured by the British. And within months, the British sweep into the mid-state, establishing British forts. These were considered communication forts that you could run from one to another, to another, to another, to carry messages. One of them was right up Old State Road, Fort Granby. Now this is an artist rendition, rendition from 1970. Uh, the fort itself is pretty accurate. Uh, when I read uh, Lieutenant Colonel Henry Lee, who is the, uh, he's a big deal, I'll talk about him in a minute. When I read his memoirs, he didn't talk about the cannons being on the other side of the river. He said that they were on the west side that Captain Finley erected a battery in the margin of the woods to the west of the forts. So look at this for the fort value and move the guns to the other side. Fort Granby was a trading post operated by Joseph Kershaw and James Chestnut. In 1781, the British captured it and built a palisaded wall, bastions, a dry moat. They piled up abatis and set up two 12 pound cannons. The fort was commanded by Major Andrew Maxwell. He's a Tory from Maryland, and he had about 340 troops, including 280 loyalists. Now, Major Andrew Maxwell is not known for any of his military accomplishments. He was known for looting, looting and plundering. Inside Fort Granby was all his stuff that his troops had stolen from nearby homes. In February, 1781, General Thomas Sumter, in command of about 300 militia, lays siege to Fort Granby. Now siege means nothing in, nothing out. It's, it's a boundary and we're just going to sit tight. He hasn't got any cannons, so he makes one. It's called a Quaker gun. It's made out of a log and it has two tobacco barrel ends. The Patriots demand that Major Ax Maxwell surrender the fort and they use this Quaker gun as a threat. But Maxwell sees the Quaker gun. He basically laughs at him and doesn't take him at all seriously. Sumter is aware that Francis Lord Rodden has a lot of British troops in Camden and he's concerned that they will come to the fort. So he takes his troops and leaves. In May, 1781, Sumter comes back, but he's better prepared this time. He has a cannon, a real one, and once again lays siege. But he hears about British supply wagons in Orangeburg. He takes his cannon, he takes half of his men to Orangeburg, and he captures his supply wagons. But who comes to the rescue? Light Horse Harry Lee. Light Horse Harry Lee is Robert E. Lee's dad. And he arrives at Fort Granby with 500 men and two six pound cannon. To talk about the light horse part, light horse is a description of a cavalry. Uh, they were lightly armed. They were more used for raiding, for scouting, patrolling, communications. And he was a uh, Lieutenant Colonel of one of those. The cannon had an effective range of about a thousand yards it shot a cast iron ball and it's highly maneuverable. So he could take these cannon wherever he needed to go. He declares Sumter's left behind men to be his. Sumter's men and Lee's own men fire muskets at Fort Granby. 
and Major Maxwell surrenders on two conditions. His men get parole and he gets to keep his plunder and he gets to keep it without anybody looking at it first. Lee is anxious to leave and he agrees. This is Maxwell's exit. I like this slide because about where these two uh, gentlemen are standing in the foreground here, uh, those are Lee's men, they wore short green coats. You can basically stand on the trail, look back at the bridge and see the bridge where this um, wagon train would have been. Sumter is completely beside himself. Fort Granby is no more, but Lee gets all the credit. Plus, Lee took his men. So he writes to General Green and he quits. They go back and forth, eventually with Sumter staying. Fort Granby is eventually restored as a trading post. Eventually, it becomes the home of James Casey. It is now physically at the bottom of the quarry, but it has been reconstructed nearby and houses the Casey Museum. In 1785, the Saxe-Gotha district becomes Lexington County in honor of the Revolutionary War battle. In 1786, Columbia becomes the state capital. And in 1820, Lexington County Courthouse is moved to Lexington. Granby declines. And thank you very much. Any questions? Very good, Sue. Thank you. Um, I've heard rumor that the regarding the Conger Creek where um, um, Conger number one was at, that that creek is, I guess it should be obvious considering how old it is, but it was wider at one time and much deeper. And that the Conger has actually changed course over the years, which again is a pretty natural occurrence. And that the river was actually a lot closer to Fort Congaree at one time, thus with the Congaree Creek being deeper and wider and the river closer, it made transportation a lot easier. I'm not sure the accuracy of that. I'm just curious if you've heard anything along those lines. Um, you are quite accurate. Let me, here we go. Uh, here you can kind of see this on the LIDAR map. Uh, you can see Fort Congaree and right where the arrow's pointing, it's like a little dark triangle. Right. I spent some time with James Stewart on this site, and he talked about that as being a watery area that the canoes would have actually pulled up on that side and they would have walked up the bank uh, toward the fort from that area. You can also see pretty uh, sizable depressions and going up toward the north from the fort. Whether right. those were um, water at that time, I don't know, but yes, the, the river has wandered. The creek has wandered, and um, hopefully someday we'll know. I'm wondering if that channel that that you see on the lidar that goes kind of north south, right? If that be a dry creek bed, because I have you know the the area where you're talking about where the Indians would pull up and put their canoes. That's bumping up next to where the sewage treatment plant is now. And if you walk that access road from the boat ramp going behind the sewage treatment plant during after wet messy weather that or that trench like area is still sometimes holds water so my guess is it might be an old creek bed or perhaps even part of the old river course maybe you know but if y'all ever get back down there sometimes after a good rain you'll notice that i'm gonna have to do that i have not been up in that area so that's interesting i i i had forgotten about this map that that yeah, that, uh, you know, a lot of things we still don't know yet about what was actually there at one time. It's, it's, it's awesome. Any other questions? Unmute your microphones and ask questions if you have some. Uh, Sue, would you go to the last slide or, or if we don't have any more questions? One quick question. You have a gift shop at the museum in um, Casey? Uh, we, we, we currently- um, we, we have a small gift shop. 
Well, the Casey Museum has a gift shop. Are you talking about uh, the Casey Museum or at the 12,000 year history park? Well, the, I don't think there's one at the 12,000 year park, right? No, we are hoping to get uh, support to have a visitor center uh, and something like that might develop there. But uh, the, um, presently the um, Casey Museum uh, has a really great facility there and they have a gift shop. And do they have um, books? available about the history they have a, they have a very small uh gift shop a handful of books a few t-shirts right. coffee cups that kind of thing nothing nothing in comparison to like the state museum or the uh military museum down by the stadium but they, they have a little bit yeah just just some uh, a small selection of books here um and uh, we'd like to add to that at some time in the future but uh you know, uh, and the, the, the thing about it is, you know, there's not a lot of um, histories written about the area, but, um, you know, there's some that we can find that have like chapters, you know, in like other books that would kind of tell you more about the area. Seems like Sue wrote the book. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, Actually, I think it's done. You just need to print it. <laughs> Not a bad idea. That's not a bad idea at all, Sue. Maybe that's uh, something to think about. Well, our, our, our uh, guides have done a lot of research and I would certainly encourage that also. Any more questions? If not, um, we can wrap this up. I want to invite you out to the park. We're hoping to, to get our in-person tours started back in the spring. And if you, if you see our website there, if you check our website, we should have some updates on our schedule for the spring, both virtual tours and in-person tours. Uh, we're hoping to get that um, up at the website in the next few weeks. I want to thank everyone for attending. Uh, Sue, a great job. And I think um, everybody realizes uh, the complexity and the interesting story that we have to tell there with Fort Congaree and the 18th century. The 18th century, to me, doesn't get the, the service it deserves in terms of our discussions, certainly in the history of the colony of South Carolina, certainly in the history of the Midlands and even on a national basis. So um, we hope to see you at the park later in the spring. In the meantime, tune in to our virtual programs, which will continue uh, uh, if we are not out in the park, but, but check our website for the latest schedule. Thank you, Sue. It was a great presentation. Maybe we'll uh, see y'all soon. Oh, thanks, DC. Thank yeah. you, John. Thanks, Thank thanks, you. Thanks, thanks all for uh, attending. Um, we will sign off. And uh, we'll, we have our next program um, on Thursday, where we'll be talking about settlement patterns in the Midlands and around the, the KC area and the Lexington area with J.C. Fennell from the Lexington County Museum. And also compare that to the settlement going on in the lower Congaree Basin near the Congaree National Park. And we'll have John Manchester from Congaree National Park uh, also participating in that discussion. So we hope to see you um, this Thursday. And yep. um, everyone stay safe and take care. If I don't have a major brain fart like last Thursday, I'll try to tune in. <laughs> okay, TC. Right. Thank you, John. Well, thank you. Thanks very much, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.